Good evening, everyone, and thank you for joining us here tonight for the Distinguished Alumnus Lecture Series. My name is Rebecca Rabani, and I'm the Associate Director of Alumni Affairs for the School of Visual Arts. The Distinguished Alumnus Lecture is a program of the Alumni Society of School of Visual Arts, whose primary mission is to raise funds for student scholarships. For details on how to become involved, please drop by our information table on your way out this evening. We take great pleasure in recognizing the achievements of our graduates since 2003. The Alumni Society has brought back dozens of notable alumni to speak to the SVA community about their work. This evening, our featured speaker is Julia Hoffman, Creative Director of Advertising and Graphic Design at the Museum of Modern Art. And here to introduce her is our former SVA faculty member, Sarah Giovianti. Sarah taught typography, graphic design, editorial design, personal book design, and portfolio from 1990 until 2011. She returned to New York after a five-year stint as a design director of the Des Moines Register and another five years in the same position at the Boston Globe. She met Richard Wilde at the Art Directors Club and he offered her a class at SVA, where she remained for 20 years. This, she says, turned out to be the greatest job of all. Please join me in welcome to the podium, Sarah. This is a very special occasion for me. Usually, I used to really like to speak without notes, but I've started to forget things, so I, I, please forgive me if I, I read my notes this time. What an honor it is for me to introduce Julia Hoffman, the creative director of the Museum of Modern Art, now named Designer of the Year by SVA's alumni. On, on, a, on a long ago Wednesday in September of 1999, I was rushing to my first sophomore typography class of the new year. As always, I stopped for a moment to tell Richard Wilde, my terrific chairman, that over the summer, I had forgotten everything. <laughs> Don't worry, he said. You open the door and it all comes back. It did. My classroom was full, a new international group cheerfully setting in, a leggy blonde was laughing as she claimed a front and center desk. Our introductions were full of promise. The vibrant blonde turned out to be Julia Hoffman, a top German student who came to SVA after a year at the University of East London. It was a brilliant class. Their work was excellent, with Julia and a small select group setting the standard and winning the prizes. Her star rose steadily as she aced her junior and senior years, developing her type skills under Karen Goldberg and Paula Scher, graduating with honors, receiving the Rhodes Family Scholarship. She hit the design world running a short successful stint as a freelance designer led to her first staff job, that of designer for Doyle Partners. Her clients were MTV, World fin finance, Financial Center, and many more. Julia's breakthrough. Her breakthrough moment came a year later. She was hired by Pentagram Design as senior designer to manage Paula Scher's design team. The energy of the place was palpable. They were creating everything, corporate identities, books, posters, and packaging for clients like John Stewart, Warner Books, Target, the Public Theater, the Metropolitan Opera, and more and more. Julia Hoffman and Paula Scher were a great team. This was the world of innovation, award-winning work days ending at midnight, taxis to Brooklyn, too excited to sleep. After four years, Julia's personal life needed some attention and she decided to make a dramatic change to leave New York for the spiritual vibe of the West. She took a job with Crispin Porter and Boguski, Boguski a 900 employee international advertising agency in Boulder, Colorado and became interactive art director of design and advertising. Her clients were Nike, Volkswagen, and Burger King, 
plus overseeing the look of the 2008 Volkswagen campaign. Communication was different in Colorado. They worked in words, Julia worked in drawings. Their days ended at 4 a.m. That took care of personal life. New York was calling, it was time to come back. Perfect timing. The Museum of Modern Art was looking for a creative director. Julia was the ideal candidate. Every job she had held had prepared her for this. Two weeks ago, I asked her to describe the position of creative director of MoMA. I have the best job in the world, she laughed. This is how it goes. The entire process begins six months before a new show. She meets with the curator and is shown the allotted space and the number of, of objects which will be displayed. Given the title of the show, she begins to make identity sketches for the museum, for ads, subway posters, the New York Times, and so on. In addition, she creates a variety of promotions depending on the show and its audience. Her department has four designers and Julia occasionally uses uh, an out, some outside talent for special shows. The workday ends at 6.30 p.m. They are all constantly engaged in a huge number of projects and Julia carefully oversees the consistency of the MoMA brand throughout. However, this is not always doable due to the different stakeholders within the institution, but it is always her big goal. And now, here is Julia. She'll show you her direct, powerful, contemporary work, always exactly right for the show, for the audience, for the moment. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for coming. Uh, thank you, Sarah, uh, for the wonderful introduction. Uh, when Rebecca asked me who organized this event, thank you. <laughs> when she asked me who I would like to introduce me tonight, um, immediately three women popped up that shaped my career. Um, and, and that is uh, Paula Scher at Pentagram, who was my former boss my mentor and my friend who also recommended me for the job at the Museum of Modern Art. It's um, Karen Goldberg, who was my teacher in junior and senior year, who helped me shape my portfolio and prepped me for the, for the workplace um, and is responsible for teaching me in graphic design. And then it's obviously Sarah Giovanniti, um, where it all began. She was my first graphic design teacher, and you'll never ever forget your first good, perfect teacher. <laughs> and she was the toughest of all. Um, so so I owe, owe you, Sarah, everything <laughs> that I learned. You laid the foundation right. Um, a few weeks ago, we met at MoMA, and we had a little chat in the cafe, and, and we were reminiscing about good old times, and. Um, and about the class, and, and I'm so glad that I actually see some people from that uh, class uh, 10 years later, or 15 or 14 years later, I don't even know how long. Um, and it was a very special class. We, um, everybody is extremely successful now. Uh, one of them is actually a partner at Pentagram. So um, something, something happened there in that one year. Um, and Sarah asked me, uh, is there anything that you learned in my class? And uh, uh, there, there were a lot of things I learned. Uh, and there are five lessons I'd like to share with you tonight that, um, that uh, Sarah taught us, or at least taught me, that I carry around with me. Number one is um, always try to learn from the best. Um, I took that advice uh, very seriously. Actually, I took it literally. I, um, I picked the best teachers that SVA could offer. Um, I drove Richard crazy <laughs> of signing him in in those classes. Um, I, I uh, tried to get um, the best employer, the, the best jobs that were out there for me. Uh, when I hire designers um, or, or people on my team, I try to hire the best people. And in life, um, I 
I chose the best partner, my husband, who's bringing out the best in me. Um, lesson number two was um, sort of more towards me. Uh, when I came, came to, to class and I had all of, these, all of this homework and all of these design iterations, and I, um, I told Sarah, I, can't, I couldn't decide. And, and I always had this problem that I can't make decisions. And I was always blaming my star sign, being a Libra, that I can't make decisions. And, 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 and she took me aside and she said, Julia, let me tell you one thing. A designer who cannot make decision is a terrible designer. <laughs> yes, you said that. And it was really, it hurt in the beginning because um, I was known for not being able to make decisions. My, my family made fun of me. And, and so now, every, seriously, every day when I have to make small or big decisions, I, I think in the back of my head I have uh, Sarah's voice of like, don't be a terrible designer, make a decision. And it's, it is so true that you have to make a decision, whether it's a bad decision or a good decision, you have to move forward, you can't stagnate. So that's my driving force. <laughs> uh, lesson number three was um, an assignment we had to design a poster. And she said, a good successful poster is, if you think about like design it with New York City, busy streets of New York City in mind, um, it's, it's across the street with four taxi cabs in between, and you still want to cross that street in order to find out more. The design has to be that compelling. And when we're designing posters for MoMA, I try to keep that in mind, um, choosing the most compelling or strongest artwork from an, art, uh, from an artist that, um, that would uh, animate people to cross the street to find out more. Lesson number four um, was speak up, make yourself heard especially as a woman. And um, that was something personally for me as well um, because sort of I'm naturally rather shy and growing up with three brothers, I was sort of more in the background. And she said, Julia, nobody's going to get you out of that corner. You have to step out. You need to speak up. And in New York City, um, you have to fight for yourself. So I'm still sort of grasping that. <laughs> um, lesson number five, the last one, was um, towards the end of the semester, uh, you invited us uh, to your house, and um, we had tea. The, I, I don't know, I think it was the whole class. And um, we started talking about other things than just graphic design. And, um, and there was also this, this other side of you. Suddenly you were this, uh, this motherly, really warm person. And in class you were really, really strict. <laughs> and um, it was really wonderful um, having these conversations about life and about the future. And, and um, you, you put us girls to the side and you said um, something that um, sounded weird to me in the beginning, um, but it made, it made total sense. Um, you said not every woman, woman needs to have a child and get married. Um, don't let society tell you how to live your life. Um, you, you make your choices. And um, that when you're in your early 20s and, and everybody back home is, is getting married and having children and thinking of New York women of sort of focusing on their career as, as, as weirdos. Um, that, that was sort of a really good advice that we are not weirdos. And I'm, I'm also proud to say that um, um, after 10 years that my husband and I are expecting a child in the summer. So <laughs> I'm really glad that. <laughs> I, I'm glad I waited, but I'm also glad that it's happening. And <laughs> so, so these were the, the main five lessons um, that uh, Sarah taught me. And in its five lessons, there are still almost every single day in me. And, um, and thank you so much for that. Um, Sarah also asked me if I had um, any early school work to share. <laughs> so that, that's, that's rather embarrassing. Um, and I, I, um, I looked through my old hard drives <laughs> and I did actually find the very, very first design exercise I did with the computer. In a, uh, I was so surprised that Quark Express opened in InDesign. <laughs> um, so, uh, and I just asked her because I didn't remember what really the assignment was and it was, it was um, uh, called Letter Forms. And uh, we had to use our initial from our last name in upper and lower case and make that letter the star and do whatever and just use, I think, two colors. So uh, here it is. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
Um, and then later on, we had to um, uh, do posters. I mean, this is really embarrassing. This was probably a third time that I used the computer. Um, and I, I thought actually that she gave this assignment to everybody, um, learn to read. Um, but apparently we were the only class. But I'll come back to this later because there's, there's sort of this stereotype that graphic designers don't read. And um, uh, yeah, <laughs> so, so but whatever. So while I was digging in the archives, I actually found, found this poster. Um, and uh, in 1999, I was already designing a poster for the Museum of Modern Art, which I thought was funny, and I just couldn't resist to bring that here. So, um, so later on, uh, we, in junior and senior year, we, we worked on these uh, um, packaging concepts and, and cu cultural institution and identities. But in my last year, I wanted to focus on editorial work. Um, so I created these two magazines. And I loved working on um, magazines because you were in control of everything. You were sort of the photo editor, you were the journalist, you were the designer, you were the art director, and you could create um, this flow of, of these pages and you could um, tell a story with images. Um, this is a completely different magazine that I did in Karen's class where we had to sort of create our own photography and um, typography. And she always sort of said, um, think of, um, take a cinematic approach when designing a uh, magazine and you want to tell a story with pictures. Um, so when it came to finding a job, I knew I didn't want to be in editorial design because I did an internship at Conde Nast before and um, I knew that I won't be able to sort of control the whole thing um, and just sort of be stuck with pages. Um, so I, um, I took my first job at Doyle Partners, and which sort of prepared me for everything to come in the future, uh, working on sort of small projects like book covers and CD covers. And then I landed my dream job uh, my, uh, at Pentagram, of if, uh, working with Paula Scher, who, who was my design hero and is still my design hero. <laughs> Um, so my first real big project was working on a book, so similar to a magazine with multiple page pages, um, but this time it was a little bit different, obviously. Um, it was the book for John Stewart, America the Book, and here I faced uh, my first real new challenge, and that was to read. <laughs> so, um, and not only to read, but also understand. Um, and for, for a non-English native speaker, that's, uh, that's sort of, um, that was extra challenging. <laughs> so it took me probably um, uh, twice as much as it would, would have taken anyone else. Um, so uh, sort of reading, understanding these, and, and trying to figure out what, what were they trying to say, and then designing it, and then putting it to an actual layout. And um, luckily, every second page was a, a chart. Um, so that made it sort of easier for me to understand and digest the information. And at the end of it, it was actually a lot of fun. So, so now what? Um, I, uh, I needed to choose something else. Um, after four and a half years, I, I wanted to move on. I wanted to learn something, something else. And I remembered um, Richard Wilde's amazing grading system. And I don't know if that's still being done at SVA, but when I was in school, he gave us always two grades, one for concept and one for execution. And, and every year you got these two grades. And um, I think there, there, there's something, there, I, I really love this, this idea of having um, a concept and execution a, as a perfect balance and because a, a concept that is badly executed won't survive in the world. And an execution that doesn't have a concept is completely shallow and is gonna die. So they, they're, they're um, absolutely interdependent with each other and um, have to support each other. So um, I, I sort of figured out the, the designing part and I learned from the best in, the, in my first five years, but now I wanted to also learn about the concepting part a little bit more. And um, 
where else, I mean, other than in advertising agencies, do you learn about concepting? So I took this job at Crispin Porter and Bogusky, an advertising agency in Colorado. And um, my days were suddenly completely different. There, we, for like four or five days, we didn't even design. We just sat there, and they actually had the term concepting, um, where we like, were sitting there with our copywriter partners, and we're talking about ideas and handing in a Word document with like 25 ideas written, written down. So it was a completely different way of working, but nevertheless interesting. But after one year, I sort of became itchy and I wanted to design again. And when the, um, the MoMA job opened up and the task was to combine the advertising department with the graphic design department, I thought it had my name all over that because suddenly I could combine my two loves of these two things and sort of going back um, what we were taught by Richard Wilde in, in our school to really marry these two things. Um, I think you also can equate um, concept to thinking and execution to designing. Um, so, so ideally, you want your project to be like that in, in, in perfect harmony. But we all know that that's not always the case. So as I pointed out in the beginning, you may actually have to design a lot because you have to flex your muscles and become like, good in your craft, um, or you have someone else that does the thinking for you. And then later on, when you become really good in designing and you know all the shortcuts, you may um, design much faster. Or later on, as a creative director, you may, may not design as much anymore. I, I hear that a lot from, from my peers, um, that they miss designing. We all know that the reality actually looks like that. <laughs> There's a lot of that other crap that have, we have to do. But sometimes, um, you just have to, to go back to the project and you have to think a lot and, and that's not great and you're overthinking a project actually. And then it goes also in the other, other way, you're, you're going back and it doesn't really work and, and you're over designing it. And, 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 and when that happens and, and it just goes too long and you just have to kill the project because designing and, and thinking shouldn't be so hard if just start from scratch and start something new. So where does all of this designing and thinking happen at the Museum of Modern Art? Um, it unfortunately doesn't happen in these beautiful, empty, white galleries. Um, we're just like any other ordinary midtown office with low recessed ceilings and carpet, and yes, cubicles. <laughs> so this is our um, office space. And this is, this is the team. Unfortunately, this photo is six months old, so there are already new members and some members left. Um, but I want to tell you that everything I'm going to show now has been done by this absolutely amazing team of designers, production managers, coordinators, copywriters, um, interns. They all put their equal share in there and, um, and work really, really hard. Um, we, our workload is um, sort of divided in these three parts. We work on exhibitions, advertising, and other stuff. And other stuff I mean sort of like brochures and signage and everything else that comes, comes along. And all of these things are sort of um, intertwined with each other. So I'll walk a few, few, um, through a few projects that um, require either less thinking or, or more thinking. Um, because we have such a huge workload, we, um, we have to sometimes cut corners with templates. And so we have this really amazing template that was designed by Paula Scher um, uh, in 2008 that is our advertising template. And um, it is, is super easy and flexible. It has the black MoMA logo, so it doesn't compete with the artwork. The artwork is the hero. And you know immediately where and what and when it is. Uh, if you want to find out more, you can find out more on the small little copy. We take um, great liberty with the template. Uh, we uh, splice up the MoMA logo. And we try to pick the most compelling image. Note, Sarah. <laughs> and so everything sort of like when you see a MoMA ad, um, 
sort of looks cohesive and you can recognize that it, it's at MoMA. And that's important in a city like New York where our competitors like the Met or the Guggenheim may actually have um, one of the same exhibitions on view a month before or later. And then all of our collateral also looks that way. Um, the next project is a project where it actually required very, very little designing. And um, this, is, uh, this project came to uh, happen when we were asked to design an advertising campaign that would um, bring in visitors um, no matter what kind of exhibition we have. So um, we, we were, I was looking at the museum and our most fluid assets actually are the artists and the visitors. And when they come together um, every day, like, I mean, there's, there's always something happening in the museum. Um, and I truly believe in this quote by Marcel Duchamp that it's actually the visitors that are completing the artwork and that there's so, some sort of dialogue happening. And we were asking ourselves, who are these visitors? What are their dreams? And um, what are they inspired by? And why are they coming to MoMA? And we're sitting, um, sort of we're brainstorming, we're sitting in our production table, and um, one of the designers, actually an SVA grad, um, was sort of saying, well, word of mouth is still the most powerful method of advertising. Wouldn't it be great if someone would tell their friend, I went to MoMA and I saw this wonderful thing and it changed my life. So we're like, oh, there is something to the sentence. And we started Googling it and, um, and already found these, these personal blog entries of people telling their story about their trip to MoMA. So we um, printed out we, um, these little cards and did a little experiment downstairs in the lobby. And what we found was really surprising. People uh, uh, really surprised us in terms of like, they, they were really poetic answers, uh, beautiful drawings. Um, and uh, they were very excited to participate and tell us what they think. So um, after a while, we um, picked the best cards that we liked and used them in advertising in small space ads or in, in big um, outdoor posters. And simultaneously, we um, uploaded them on a website where people could um, share them with their friends. And then in the lobby downstairs, they can scan them in themselves, and then it gets projected to the wall. And, and we learned that um, sharing and the creativity and expression is extremely important for our visitor, and um, that a museum nowadays should be fully participatory, um, transparent, and in constant flux. It should be alive. Um, our ideal design uh, assignment is creating these identities for these exhibitions. We have 12 special exhibitions a year, and um, the designers really have um, complete freedom of whatever they want to do. Obviously, it has to fit to the exhibition. We get uh, briefed six months in advance, and, um, and then we just go back and create these almost sort of mini brands. And sometimes the artist even gets involved himself. And because the workload is so intense, um, we, we wanted to figure out like how can we create some more templates without um, compromising our creativity. And uh, uh, so we had still 28 exhibition that were based on our permanent collection. And they're in smaller galleries and they rotate quite frequently. And um, we, th there's one thing that you have to understand, like curators are not ordinary clients. Curators are really, really smart people. They, they know everything about typefaces, they have triple PhDs, they, they, they know their stuff. So you can't really bullshit them of like using whatever typeface. They're like, oh, that wasn't invented at that time. So 
Um, so you constantly sort of have these like 28 conversations about typefaces that sometimes go like over weeks. And so in, in order to speed things up, but also in order to um, have some sort of consistency, because not everybody had good taste, um, we said, okay, why don't we fall back on our typeface? Um, it's um, MoMA Gothic that uh, Matthew Carter drew based on Franklin Gothic and uh, used just one typeface for these 28 exhibitions. And you can imagine that didn't go well um, um, among the curators as well as designers. They're like, you're taking away my freedom and my, my freedom of expression and I, I, need, I need all of these five million typefaces out there. Um, but we proved them wrong and um, something wonderful happened actually. We uh, were now able to really focus on what the content of the exhibition was, and we could really experiment with the application of the title wall. Um, this was a small show for Paolo Antonelli, and we used a lenticular lens um, to emphasize the concept of, of uh, design over time. And so it's, it's really um, fun to, to see what everybody comes up with, and here we're actually bastardizing the typeface and cutting it apart. Um, but we, we know the typeface so well that, that uh, we feel like we can do that. And so it still sort of fits together, but nobody lost their individuality. Um, sometimes we also are asked to um, help generate revenue in the museum because we're sort of indirectly responsible for driving traffic to the museum. Um, this, this assignment was a little bit different. We had to, um, membership came to us and we had to convert visitors, paying visitors that come to the museum and convert them into members. So we were wondering like how can we sell membership within a museum and it's, it's a little tricky because we can't plaster the museum with ads um, because uh, it, sort of the white walls are sacred. And so we looked at locations where there was, wasn't any artwork and where people would be um, sort of in transit or um, wouldn't have anything else to look at, like the elevators or the bathrooms or the cafes. And then we also looked at um, how do we want to communicate this. Um, we, I never really liked the word joining because I feel like you join a gym, but you want to, um, there should be something more. And so we came up with this thing as belonging to something and then have anyone insert their own emotion um, and have this adjective belonging to something confusing or enlightening, have that that has like a double or triple meaning that it should mean something to the artwork as well as the benefit of the membership or the space where you would encounter. So in an elevator, it made sense to uh, say belong to something uplifting or belong to something elevating. So we wanted to hit the visitor with these small space messages throughout their visit in the museum, hoping that maybe if after they've seen it, and this was in a cafe, after they've seen it, uh, maybe like multiple times they would act in the lobby and sign up. This was for a member previews. And then in the beginning, we gave them a ticket that you practically belong already if you would buy two more tickets. And that also gave us uh, a great pattern to play with um, in the brochures, in the lobby, and the retail store used it as well to sell products inside the store as well as outside. So, <clears throat> the last project is, uh, is a project that went south. And um, I want to bring this, I want to show this with you guys um, because it, it, um, it, there, there's a good lesson that we can all learn from that. And um, it was a project that started a little bit over a year ago. And we were again tasked with this assignment of creating an advertising campaign to bring in um, tourists uh, no matter what kind of exhibitions we have. And the conversation started with, uh, there was a New York Magazine article that said that M New York City has 50 million visitors coming to New York City. And 40 million of these are domestic visitors. 
And so we scratched our head and said, well, if we look at our audience, 70% of them are international and 30% are domestic. Why are not those domestic visitors coming to MoMA? And uh, so, okay, let's, let's really dive deeper into this and figure this out. And uh, we, we wrote a proper brief and uh, we hired a strategist and uh, engaged our media agency to come up with a plan and um, really looking at um, which area of uh, the, the tri-state area we wanted to target from Boston to Philadelphia. And so we did our proper homework, which we not always do. We usually sort of just um, come up with the idea and then execute it. But this time, we wanted to do it right. And um, so we came up with a campaign, and we presented it, and it wasn't right. Uh, it just didn't feel right. And so then we went back to the drawing board and looked at everything what we have. And um, we were sort of under time pressure because we wanted to be out by spring. And, um, and we were totally um, already um, past deadline. And so we, we sort of looked at it like, what do we want to advertise? And, and basically, what we had in front of us is like, advertise everything for everybody. And um, already a red flag should have gone up here. And uh, what we found out is that people, so we, we I try to diagram this, okay, what is in this brief? <laughs> How, uh, what do we want to communicate? And basically, what we wanted to communicate is that we also have shopping areas. I mean, because we found out from, uh, from research studies that all of these domestic tourists want to go shopping, and they want to go eating, and they want to do something with their kids. And so we looked at our offerings, and we realized, well, we, we do have three restaurants. We have stores. Um, you can bring your kids. So you can watch videos. You can go to parties. And we thought that anything they're interested in, we have. And we played this game with, with ourselves. Uh, if you're interested in basketball, we have Jeff Kuhn's basketball on the second floor. We have amazing photographs in the collection. Uh, you name it, we have it. Um, and we can sort of make it up somehow. Um, so, so we translated this into, this worked really well in theory, and uh, we translated this into an ad. And uh, ta-da, here's the ad. And suddenly someone said, well, we have to tell that we open seven days. Oh, we have to tell that we have this exhibition. And we do this. And why can't we just squeeze in this one and this one? And so what do you remember? A, a bunch of stuff. And I think that's what happened. I think a lot of people said, like, there was a bunch of stuff, but I don't remember what I saw. Um, so we, we didn't, didn't realize that right away. <laughs> um, so we, it took a really long time to create these because we wanted to be also, and this came out in the summer, so we used first summer, um, and we, we created uh, these ads based on where they are, in which publication, at what time. And so there was a lot of research, and we had to clear all of the images. We had to talk to the estates. We had to image correct them, uh, color correct them. Um, we had to get them approved by the curator. And this time's like, I mean, 20,000. Um, this, this fence banner, I think, um, <laughs> well, <laughs> I don't want to go there. Um, so in theory, this worked really well. And, and, and this was actually the microsite, and, and there we um, uh, went against sort of a technology problem um, as well because we, we envisioned it as being sort of like this amazing uh, uh, magical tool where everything would grow out of it and somehow um, we were just sort of limited um, with, with the coding that it, it just didn't work out. Um, it, it, it worked a slightly better in the 15 second TV spot that I'll share here. Oh, there's no sound? Oh. <laughs> so we realized that it really, we were stretching ourselves really thin here. And we were trying so hard to make this work. And um, we were going back, and, and, and we had arguments about it. And it was just like everybody was in a bad mood. And it's something. You just have to, it, it's something similar, I, I tried to explain this um, to a friend, and um, it's something when you, you, when you buy like a really expensive sweater, and, uh, and it doesn't fit, and you just uh, try it on, and you put it back into your uh, closet, and 
you not just don't dare to throw it out and you try it on again and it just doesn't work out. And you just have to have the courage to throw it out and start from scratch and don't feel bad about it. Um, so that's what we did. Um, so I think uh, the most important thing um, that, that is, uh, apart from thinking and designing, is actually your gut. And your gut is, is, is so important um, in this equation that I, I would almost say it's, it's more important than thinking and designing. But um, it, don't forget about that. Um, if, if, you don't, if you don't feel that it's right, um, listen to your guts. And, and I think that's what SVA was doing really, really well. They, was, they were trying to develop your gut and your intuition in those four years. Um, and so I, I, I really thank SVA for that. Thank you. So I think we have like a little bit of time for questions, if, if there are, but no worries if they're not. <laughs> okay, so how do curators feel about the typography and how long have they lived with it? I think we um, started uh, like three or four years ago, and you know what? Some don't even notice that it's all the same typeface. Yeah, they were like, what? You use only the same typeface? No. <laughs> I, I mean, I, I'd love to say that there's no difference between designing a magazine and designing anything else, because if you're a great designer, you could design anything. Um, I know that employers uh, think otherwise sometimes, because they just flip through portfolios really quickly. So I think it's up to you to convince whoever you're interviewing with that um, you're not just an editorial designer, you can do everything else. and. It's just one way of designing, so <laughs> stay positive. <laughs> oh, um, I don't think I need to distract myself. I think um, uh, deadlines are really good. I, I could not work without deadlines, um, um, and the sooner the better. So I, we all, I mean, you know, third year students, you always work in the last minute, so um, <laughs> I embrace deadlines. Um, we have, I mean, it really depends to who it is, but most of the time um, when it is to curators, which is the majority, um, we have them come to our space. And there, there was a slide um, of our studio space where we have a really large wall and we pin up uh, three of the ideas, uh, maximum five of ideas, and um, just walk them through on our wall. Um, we, it used to be different. We used to go to their office, but um, we changed that. We made them come to us so they see um, the sort of creative round. And then um, we, we do the same thing, actually, with the director most of the time. Yeah. The, the curator comes up with all the content. So he writes the text, and then the education department sort of uh, goes through it and makes sure that it's um, good for an audience. And then when they deliver the text to us, then we put it into labels, intro text, and captions, yeah. And uh, there, there's a dialogue, obviously. We, we pick it, for the special exhibitions, we pick a special typeface for all of this. Um, for all of our other exhibitions, we have one standard typeface that we use. Because some, sometimes a show has like 600 labels. So um, we, I mean, for an exhibition, we get briefed um, um, from the curator, and then everybody goes back to their desk and uh, make sketches and then we meet and we present to each other and we critique each other and then um, when it's in a good shape then we present to the curator um, so that that's sort of a standard process and and for advertising campaigns it's it's a little bit more it's more stretched out we we talk to a lot of people um, there are a lot of discussions and meetings and um, uh, um, and it's it's sort of we, we pin up a lot of ideas on the wall um, in the beginning, sort of no idea is a bad idea. And then uh, gradually over the weeks, we go through them and we read them out. We cluster them in themes and, um, and then make it into a presentation from there. Sort of it's, it's very analog. 
Oh, it was huge. Uh, the, she asked about the culture shift moving from New York to Colorado. Um, it's and the reason also I wanted to go, I mean, it was not the reason, but uh, par partially is why I wanted to go to Colorado is because New York is not America. Um, and I really wanted to see what else is out there. So it, it's completely different. Um, you're, you're driving a car. There's, there's no sort of, I mean, Boulder was a tiny little university town, so I, I can't generalize here. Um, but there weren't any posters on the street, so there was no visual stimulation. Um, also, my situation was different because I was working in an office like literally 24 hours 7, so um, I didn't really see anything from, from Colorado. Um, uh, so it was the opposite of New York City. <laughs> yeah, I was really reluctant to go to an in-house design studio because it's like really not sexy when you hear about this. Um, but uh, I changed my opinion completely. Um, it, it's really great. Um, in, in an agency, you dive into a project for let's say two, three months and you pitch that project, whether it's a redesign or, or whatever. And, and then you walk away and then you let the client do whatever with your design, what they do. And um, you don't have any control. So um, I, I, I experienced that myself when we, when we did a redesign and it, it worked well for six months and then later on you see it somewhere and you're like, oh my God, what have they done with the design? And, and in, in house, you really can nurture the brand and you can really be with everything that you've done and you can see it grow up. Um, and it's, it's not repetitive and boring at all. It's actually, it's actually really refreshing because after a while you know the brand so well and, um, and you can try different things that you would never try in an agency because you're your own client and you can, um, you can try something, you can go downstairs and see does it work or does it not work and, and you have so many more opportunities to also mess up um, because you know that there is going to be another project right afterwards. So your client doesn't walk away, which is also a good thing. And <laughs> um, fortunately, it's, it's quite uneven. Um, so the majority is more sort of uh, managing and going to meetings and, and sort of coordinating uh, versus designing. I, I did a little experiment in the last three weeks of um, canceling 75% of my um, meetings and uh, working on the redesign for the retail catalog. and. Um, that was really refreshing. So um, uh, I, I really miss designing, and um, I've, I've, that's something that I give an advice. Uh, becoming a creative director, you really should not forget. Um, don't let that balance uh, go far from each other so in a way. Um, but yeah, no. The reality is that um, if one of one of us has to go to these meetings and manage, so. Um, hiring people is really difficult. Um, I never knew that. Um, uh, I, I, I think it, uh, I was extremely lucky that I, I always uh, try to hire um, good, good people. Um, it, I, I, I tend to like figure, I mean, I think like you can figure this out in the first meeting, in the interview, if that person is a good fit or not, but You'll never say never, um, um, but no, you, there is no guarantee for that. But I think um, you, I mean, you, you, you see the portfolio, you see the, the person, and um, you, you maybe do some reference checks or something, but um, it, yeah, there's no guarantee. The difference between, well, no, I mean, designing a, an exhibition, it, it doesn't matter. I mean, it can be, it can be silk screen to the wall. It could be 3D printed. It could be, um, right now, Paolo Antonelli's show, we, we actually did the whole thing in processing where we project um, uh, an animation that is sort of interactive. So uh, it, it, I, I don't think there's a difference in printing, uh, designing for exhibition designs, I think. Uh, where do I look for inspiration? Um, I get that asked a lot, um, and I would always love to answer while well, I just go downstairs in the galleries and walk around, um, which I don't. Um, there's, there's sort of never really time. Um, you find inspiration everywhere, where, wherever you go, whatever your assignment is. Um, I, I feel New York City for me is really inspirational, what, just walking around the streets and just wandering around aimlessly. and and just see whatever you see or whatever, whoever you meet. Um, but I, I, I couldn't pinpoint um, 
I, do, I don't have that source of inspiration somewhere. It's just, you know, at least expect it somewhere. So. Okay, so this was again a process, process question about how uh, we work. Um, we, unfortunately, because we're only six designers and we have 1,200 projects, we can't really all work on the same project. So um, we maximum work maybe three people when it's a really big project, or sometimes we get like an outside copywriter to join us. Um, but most of the time it's, it's two people. So we, yes, we concept maybe together. And then, um, and some, sometimes when there's big, exhibi um, ex big exhibitions or big uh, campaigns, uh, maybe for the first day we concept together and everybody puts their ideas and then when we condense it and select what we liked then only that person um, or one or two people are going to lead the project and then continue it forward. But um, unfortunately we don't have the, um, the, the manpower to all work on, on everything. So everything is sort of like assigned. Cool, shall we? Unless there's another question. No? Okay. Thank you so much. <laughs>